All right, welcome to Hygiene Elevated Conversations and Innovations. And we are very excited today because we have Dr. Jameson Wagner, my doctor that I have the pleasure to work with um, all the way out in Tooele. And so I would love to hear from you, Dr. Wagner, a little bit more of your story. Introduce us, give us your background, why you chose dentistry, and what has led you to the path that you're on right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm Dr. Jameson Wagner, a uh, recent grad from the University of Utah. Just graduated uh, this year, spring 2023. Um, and I recently started working out at a general practice office out in Tooele. I get to work with Amanda. She's our hygienist at the office and does an amazing job. Um, and so, yeah, a little background on why I kind of zeroed in on dentistry. So, the first exposure that I remember to dentistry was when I was about maybe eight or nine years old. My uncle, he had a dental practice in Salt Lake City, where I'm from. And so his sons would help clean the practice, especially on the weekends, go in, vacuum everything, clean the windows and whatnot. And because his son was one of my best friends, I was tagging along one of these times and I was like, wow, what are all these fancy, shiny instruments here? Like, this is kind of cool. And I wanted to learn more about it. And when I learned a little more about it, I was like, that's cool. Also a little bit scary, but kind of <laughs> cool. <laughs> and so I just kept kind of kept that in the back of my mind. And so all in school, I was convinced that I was going to do something with math, um, mostly like accounting. And that was probably because my grandfather was an accountant. My dad was an accountant. Um, now, ironically, my wife is an accountant, um, as is my older brother and my younger brother. So wow. I'm kind of the, you the, are the rebel family. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in school and everything, I always enjoyed the sciences. I could always excel. It always made sense to me. I loved learning about the human body and just everything, how it all works together. And so I eventually came to a crossroads on, okay, do I want to do more practice medicine, practice dental, just anything in that field? Because I knew that's what I wanted to do. And the reason I chose dentistry was because I really liked the aspect of being able to work with people one-on-one -on -one and to be able to use my hands, not just work and solve problems, um, trying to figure out how to help people, but also actively solve those problems, use my hands, get to know people, build relationships, and also change their lives. So the more and more I um, learned about it, the more I was fascinated. And I think the the real turning point that turned me on to it was um, actually the same uncle. I went to go shadow him, and he was doing a full mouth rehabilitation for this lady who she had a lot of difficulties in her life with alcoholism, bulimia, and her old dentition and everything was just destroyed. And being able to visit with him through these appointments and see how I could just see her countenance change throughout all these appointments. And I thought that was amazing. And that's something I was like, I wanna do that. And so that's why I chose dentistry and it's been extremely fulfilling in my uh, short experience so far and I don't have any regrets. That's a that's such a great backstory. I, I remember you talking about um your dad being in accounting and your wife as well, but I just didn't process it in the way that you just described it. And I can't imagine with your personality, you being an accountant, <laughs> that does not, <laughs> not seem the right, the right path for you. So I think you made the right call. Yeah. Now that yourself. I've married my wife, we've said I either had to be an accountant or marry one and I'm content with my decision. <laughs> <laughs> solid, solid. Well, I like how you said that, um how you loved solving problems but with your hands because that is pretty much what took my career from like hygiene to consultant was that like underlining talent of like finding a problem and having like a very creative solution to it that's like one of my favorite things so when you said that i was like oh we're like we're on the same beat already tonight i'm like mm -hmm. this. um okay so Amanda and Dr. Wagner, you guys work together. I want to know what is the hardest part about working with Amanda? 
Do you want me to go get the list that I've been accumulating in the please do. Please do. every all his 45 minute commute, like, oh, he did this again today. Well, well decompress, yeah. I mean, I've been working with Amanda a lot longer than you have, so we could True. compare notes here. Okay, okay. And no, I um I don't know if this is just unique to Amanda and the other hygienists I've worked with, or if it's something that's taught in hygiene school. But it seems like she always knows right when I'm busy and says, hey, when you get a minute, <laughs> if you could come in. <laughs> and then I always wait make until sure I hear the me. drill start. <laughs> See, I knew it. And then as soon as I'm like, okay, yeah, that's, I'll be in in a minute. She makes sure to always leave with my pleasure. So I really know that it's her pleasure that uh, she's pulling me away from whatever I'm focusing on. <laughs> Oh, you get a different version of Amanda than I do then, because I would have to say... Do I need to start saying my pleasure more often, Joffrey? That was just like I need to start saying year. thank you more often, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. I'm no, not messing no. everything up. No, no, no. Amanda is an absolute delight to work with, and her and I could not be more different from one each mm -hmm. other. Uh, we took a personality test just to prove it. And um, one thing that is super cool about working with Amanda is I will have all of these ideas, and she becomes like my hype girl and is like, yes, let's do all of those. Um, that's the first thing I love about working with her. The second one would have to be I will come up with all these ideas and she'll say, and let's get back on track. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love that for you. <laughs> Everyone needs that in their life. Someone to hype them up, but also keep them on track. <laughs> yes, that is, that is Amanda for me. Um, in fact, I just like love Amanda so much. I try to recruit her all the time, but um, she's pretty sold to the, <laughs> the Euro guys. Yeah, job. by recruit, she means she wants me to commute all the way up to Park City. That's that's what I that means. I actually now have an opening in Magna, so oh, a little right. closer. Mm -hmm. um, You'll but have yeah. to pry her from our dying arms in order to get her. <laughs> Oh, okay. But, well, okay. Uh, now, yes. Um, yeah. Now that my ego is huge, guys. <laughs> so. We've agreed how awesome Amanda is. Um, but I do want to ask you a few questions as a new graduate. So, in your opinion, did dental high? Or, sorry, did dental school um, prepare you for being a leader in the clinic? Um, and this one, I'm gonna have to say a yes and a no. I don't feel like it was one of the specific goals um obviously we had our courses on practice management and all of that um and you kind of had to learn how to do that and how to interact with patients on your own and kind of take charge i really feel like school you would get out of it what you put in um and i was fortunate enough so i was able to um i was lucky enough to get into the university of utah and they have a program called the pathways program up there where they would have different specialty groups that would meet once a week so you had like your oral surgery your perio your pediatrics and the one that i decided to hop onto along with five of my classmates was called the business leadership pathway and it was led by a doctor who would come up to the school once a week and he actually taught the practice management courses which are just extremely basic practice management principles. Um, but in this pathway, he would get a lot of different speakers and people to come in and present to us. Um, we talked about like KPIs, did everything from like hiring to firing. Um, that was fun sitting across from him and you'd be given a scenario and you'd have to say, you know, this is inadequate, this is why, and kind of explain all that stuff. Um, we also went over like different practice models, different valuations. And I feel like that was the most valuable resource for me. Um, like I said, it was just a small cohort of us six and our instructor for that. And I feel like I got the most out of that. And I know a lot of my other classmates didn't as much. Um, but honestly, after being out, even the short time that I've been out, there really is no substitute for being out there in the clinic and actually taking charge and being that leader. And 
I would like to think that I'm perfect and great at it, but I know that I'm learning a lot and I have office leaders or Amanda or just whoever saying, Hey, maybe let's, let's fix this. I'm like, okay, thank you. And just, I think one of the qualities that I've learned is being humble enough to take that feedback. And I think that's one of the things that I always heard, but finally was able to internalize that being a good leader means being able to take that feedback and being accountable for your leadership to all those people you're ahead of. I feel like that is worthy of a quote on a billboard somewhere, because I don't think (laughs) I've experienced that enough um, in so many doctors that I've worked for. It's no, I'm the boss, the end. And there's a severe lack of humility. And it's like, yeah, maybe not, uh, (laughs) maybe not the best route to go. So I, I would say you are excelling at that, Dr. Wagner. So well, thank you. And as um, always, I, just, I appreciate any feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, who was the doctor that was heading up that uh, course? So his name was Dr. Andrew Olson. He's okay. not the Andrew Olson that's within Platinum, our group. Um, he's another Dr. Andrew Olson because it's kind of a, I guess, generic name you could say. <laughs> but um, he has a practice up in Mill Creek and it's just a general practice and he would come up about once a week, like I said, and teach that practice management course. And he put together an awesome curriculum for our cohort. Okay. I was just curious. I temped at an office at some point in the last three years in the Mill Creek area. And I remember he, the doctor that I worked for at that time, um, or sorry, attempt for at that time, um, did something up at the University of Utah. And that was probably the most rigid time crunch of an office I've ever seen. Like I was temping half a day. And so I was like, okay, I'm done with my x-rays and the cleaning. And he pulled me aside and he's like, you will come get me at this time. I will come in at this time and we will dismiss the patient at this time. And normally I'd be like, okay, okay. But I was like, I am a temp. Like, I'm not going to learn your way. Like, I'm here for four hours. No, like, and I'm, I'm like, very easygoing person, but I was like, uh-uh, I'm not interviewing for a job. <laughs> like, I'm here that, for yeah. hours, sir. No. So that I seems was just like a curious. practice model that would be very successful, but would kind of take a little time to to get up to yeah. speed on. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, that's a very interesting it, it was interesting. And I went the other day of it and I don't know what I was thinking, but whatever. um okay, I'm gonna ask <laughs> Amanda a question here. When it comes to leadership from the dentist. How, like, what are you looking for when you work in an office? What are you looking like? What would be like the ideal leadership from your doctor? Ooh, turning the tables on me. (laughs) Um, I think competence, um, somebody that I uh, have respect for. Um, I respect somebody that sits down, knows the patient has gotten their head around the situation going on with the patient. Um, and it's just engaged in the staff, in the patients, um, just in the practice in general, not somebody that's like, um, I don't know, half-hearted into it, but somebody that's just vested um, and really cares and gets to know the patients and just is really putting forth that effort. And definitely, humility like you said dr wagner like that that's something you know no matter how long you've been practicing um you know you're not always going to be right you're just not um but i think especially as a new grad i know like today with the laser um i was like i'm not trying to talk down to you but that's not right (laughs) um uh, but i know like our knowledge like between the two of us we are unstoppable i can tell you that Um, But just like being able to have respect for your coworkers and being able to um, put people in that position where they can succeed and just move the practice forward, I guess, is what I'm looking for in a doctor. I like that because we talk about like, um, or I say frequently, I want to see these doctors being leaders in their clinic. And someone could say to me, Joffrey, nobody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> and so it's great to hear somebody else's perspective on what that looks like. Yeah. And I would um, 
here's a brag for Dr. Diaz because I feel like I was bashing him earlier today with his Pepsi love. But Dr. Diaz, and I know you don't know Dr. Diaz, Joffrey, but he was my doctor at, at Daybreak. Um, I felt like he was honestly a really strong leader. And especially for so young, like I think he's maybe a smidge older than you are, Dr. Wagner, but he owns two of the practices within Platinum and um, he's doing a good job of it. And so he's definitely good on the administrative side. So I have respect for Dr. Diaz for sure. Um, yeah, that's my tidbit. Okay, so Dr. Wagner, I wanna ask you, was it strange leaving um, dental school where you did everything without an assistant to now coming into practice and having an assistant? What was that like? Incredible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That was, I mean, you, I mean, in school, you have your like four hour clinic block, you'll see one patient um, and you can be doing anything from like a crown. Sometimes it's even just a filling or a recall exam. And yeah, like you said, we're doing a lot of the stuff on our own, coordinating with the patient, scheduling them, running over the billings and the costs, um, getting them roomed, getting all the materials, making sure you have everything set up. And I think that's all really important to learn. But I think I will always remember the first time sitting down and working with an assistant. I was like, holy cow, this is amazing. Like, this is going so quick. And um, my assistant was like, okay, hey, I'm going to go take them up front. Front desk is going to go over the costs and stuff and make, collect the payment. And I'm like, this is really nice. I can get used to this. <laughs> and so I'm like, this is awesome. So I start cleaning up the room after and stuff. And then my assistant comes back and says, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, cleaning the room. Sorry, like I don't know where some of the things go. I'm sure I'm misplacing a few of them. <laughs> and she's like, "That's my job. I've never had the doctor come help clean the room." And I'm like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> so it took a little getting used to, kind of accepting that help. But honestly, it's been fantastic. And to be able to have someone alongside with you to be able to help answer or reassure the patient. Sometimes the patient will see the doctor is just someone who's trying to sell them everything in the book and to be able to have that assistant or even the hygienist to be able to kind of reaffirm things that they're seeing or to talk about the treatment and potential things that are going on is I think such a invaluable resource that really helps the practice to grow. It helps me to be able to focus and optimize my time. And it's so nice to be able to have someone to talk to while you're, while you're working on patients all day too. <laughs> <laughs> and he still cleans rooms here and there like i have to come grab him hey i need an exam quit cleaning rooms like <laughs> get over here um you know when i was working with um dr almond he had two practices one in south jordan and then one downtown his downtown office only had three operatories and at the end of the day well okay so with there being three there's like no overflow so it's like incredibly hard to stay on time when there's like a doctor mm -hmm. paid chair and then like two hygiene chairs happening all day long um dr almond was so wonderful at helping us clean and it was <laughs> he didn't do it in the south jordan office but he did it in the downtown one because he knew like how on a time crunch we were and at the end of the day every downtown day we would have to um you know like like sweep and mop the floors and do all of that before we could all like check out dr almond would be like sweeping and mopping with us so that we could all hurry up and get out and um i just want dr wagner to know that is something your staff is going to remember about you forever <laughs> it, it's true it's true um instead of after that last little bit is done you're like all right and i'm out you know <laughs> i know around helping out for sure and not just like taking all of the cookies that's something i don't want to bash a doctor but that dr remington would do if somebody <laughs> would bring in crumble um if you didn't take whatever was in there he would take the whole box home <laughs> just take it all <laughs> it's like you did not you buy can't those. blame him too much crumble cookies are pretty good i can blame him like you don't just do that <laughs> That is was the team looking forward to like leftover cookies. Yeah, there were two boxes and he took both. <laughs> and not only that, like 
I feel like in most places, maybe maybe we didn't verbalize this, but with crumble, there's different flavors. You want to try all of them. No, he would take a whole cookie. A whole cookie. <laughs> Breaking <laughs> <That's> the laws. <laughs> they, the cookie make code. The, they make the cutters for a reason. It was <laughs> just so many pet peeves. So anyway, you have much better etiquette. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. In dental school, how much emphasis was there on having a, a solid hygiene department? Like, did they explain, like, how that can help your business, help your patient flow? Um, did that get incorporated in your, like, practice management at all? Tell us everything. Well, what you said is about the extent that I feel like we learned in school, <laughs> that having a good hygiene department is important. Um, in our pathway, we talked a lot about different practice models and some that were really pro hygiene. And that was one of the big focal points, others that really just minimized it as much as they could. Um, and we talked a lot about what good hygiene was for a patient, things that we should look for as providers. And obviously we took our periodontal courses. Um, but that's one thing that I really wish that we would have learned a little bit more of in school. Not just that we need a good hygiene department and this is what good hygiene is, but the structure of a good hygiene department and how to work with a hygienist. Um, I was fortunate enough to be, so we had 50 students in our class. Um, I was number 48 and number 49 was a previous dental hygienist who was going to dental school. And she was a huge advocate for the importance of a hygienist. And so I was always next to her in all the labs and stuff. And aside from all the, her helping me out to understand what all these things were at the beginning of school, um, she was a really good advocate. And so just talking with her, I think may have ironically been my best resource. I don't think she intended for it to be that way. Um, and I didn't learn all of the nitty gritty details that I'm still learning right now. Um, but yeah, like I said, we mostly in school learned that it's important to have a great hygiene department, work with a hygienist, but whatever the details were, they were kind of just left out there. That's kind of interesting considering, um, I mean, I didn't grow up here in Utah, so I'm not as familiar with the University of Utah and all its um, affiliations, um, but you were telling me that there's a very strong uh, connection with the periodontal association yeah um, i would think that they would try to kind of emphasize that a little bit more or was it just more on the get into periodontal residencies kind of a, a i feel aspect? like it was a little more a little more focused on that um yeah so the head of the american academy of uh periodontics is also the section head of Perry at the university of utah so he was a great resource, really humble, great instructor. Um, and I learned so much from him. And, but like I said, we learned more about periodontics and periodontal disease more than how to affiliate with the hygiene uh, department. The one other thing that actually was fairly helpful um, was that we would have a rotation. This was an optional rotation because it was down in St. George, but they would send four students down to work at the um, the Dixie or Utah Tech hygiene program down there. And we would mostly just see patients. And then if they had any perio issues, we would refer them back to the hygiene school. Um, but a couple sessions during that week, we would also spend with the hygienists. Um, a lot of them were just starting hygiene school. And so we would kind of walk them through the differences of like charting, um, calculating attachment loss, you know, probing depth, stuff like that. Um, so we learned what hygiene is and what periodontics are but we didn't learn as much about what makes a successful hygiene department and i wish that's something we would have learned a little bit better it's very well, interesting dr wagner i firsthand um had an opportunity a couple years ago to start working at an office that i was just like over the moon about i'm like everything in here is so beautiful like who does not want this job this place is amazing and i was totally like 
wearing rose colored glasses because once I started working, I started seeing all of this undiagnosed periodontal disease. And I didn't know at the time, but this was like the foundation of like where I, where my roots started. But um, knowing how to like run the numbers and analyze a practice, I identified, you know, we were dealing with 10% of the patients being seen for periodontal treatments. You know, fast forward to four years later, we're at like 45% of the patients being seen for periodontal treatment. And what that did to the hygiene production was it took the office from an average of 30,000 a month to 60,000 a month just by um, properly diagnosing periodontal disease. Um, we incorporated a couple of other things like advanced cancer screenings and fluoride treatments, but that's like small, small sauce compared to what the actual diagnosing of periodontal disease did for that practice. And uh, gosh, I just want to get into those dental schools and just say like, look, this is what <laughs> your hygiene department can produce for your business. Not, o not only is it great for patient care, but it's about, um, patient care and the business side of things, which is like a great segue for the next question that we want to ask you. Um, so backstory, hygienists are not often taught that dentistry is sales. That comes as like a total culture shock to us post-graduation. And for some of us, we're a lot more stubborn, like, like myself, I was like, absolutely not. I am not in sales. Like I am a healthcare provider. You'll never catch me selling anything. Um, that was a very extremely hard pill to swallow. Um, but once I did <laughs> decide dentistry is sales, my, my career just flourished. Um, so I want to know, like, how did dental school prepare you for dentistry being sales, being a business? Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, like you said, I wish we could just say, Hey, these are all the issues. Let's fix them. But unfortunately that financial barrier is usually not always, but is usually that biggest in inhibition um, and something we have to overcome and that's termed as sales. Um, and so um, my experience I feel like while we were in the clinic, kind of like I mentioned with the previous questions, you're kind of, that was my first experience kind of being thrown into the water and having to learn how to work with the patients and really sell them on treatment. Um, and that took a little bit of time learning how to present all these things that you spent so much time learning about and presenting them in layman's terms and being able to present what the problem is, how we have a solution and why that's gonna help them basically. And so I feel like we learned mostly in our didactic courses in school about kind of like you said, just providing good care and presenting um, options to patients. But the thing that helped me the most and this, I feel really fortunate too. So the way that our dental school was organized on the clinic floor is we had four different group practice leaders is what they were called. And there were 12 operatories per each group practice leader. And so those operatories weren't always filled with um, uh, student dentists, but oftentimes they were. And so the leader of our group was, um, his name was Dr. Chandler. And he was amazing at this. He was so good at talking with the patients, kind of getting on their level. And I witnessed multiple times not just with myself, but with other students, him kind of going in and being like, okay, here's what's going on. And kind of, cause the students will be like, Hey, you need an implant cause um, it's going to help you. And it's going to be a couple grand. And you can see the patients there just start kind of melting in their chairs. Their eyes get all wide. And <laughs> he would come in and be like, okay, let's, let's take a step back here and let's talk about it. Um, so I feel really fortunate to be able to have learned from him and kind of pick up on some of the metaphors and things that he would use. Um, like for example, today, I actually used one that he would frequently present where we, we had a patient coming into our office today um, near the end of the day. He has several issues going on periodontally as with caries. Um, he has two teeth that are gonna need um, endodontic therapy. 
and he needs a couple crowns, just a lot of stuff done. And so kind of bracing him for that and saying, Hey, we're here to help. We know that you understand that there are some things going on. These are all the things that we see. We're going to create this roadmap for you from point A to point B. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's on you to decide how quickly we're going to get from point A to point B. We're going to help you along along the way and let's get through this together. And really helping the patients to understand that you're on their side. You want to help them get back to good oral health. And just learning how to mesh the two of presenting the issues and the solutions along with, hey, we're not totally trying to sell this to you just because we want to make money, but we want to sell this to you because we also want to help you. And I think once patients understand that and you can connect with them on that level, it's a lot easier for them to accept that treatment. It also helps when they're in pain. Not that we want that, but <laughs> it is a motivator. That is exactly what I said to this patient today too. He's like, it hurts. I'm like, you know, if we were to let this go six more months, then we may have to be pulling these teeth. So sometimes mm -hmm. pain can actually be helpful in helping us realize there's something going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that one's, uh, that one was rough. Well, I love that you talked about like, we're here to help people because we are, it just so happens to be that we work in a business culture environment. Um, one of my go-to lines that I love talking to patients about is, their quality of life. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're missing like half your teeth on the left side here. Like, do you know, don't you want to chew over there? <laughs> like, how do you eat? <laughs> you know? So my, the biggest like advocate for getting patients to um, accept the treatment that's about to come from the doctor, like they don't even know what's going to be diagnosed yet is, um, uh, your quality of life. So as their hygienist, I'm already coaching them on we need to do something so that you can live a better life. And then the doctor gets to come in and be the superhero and tell them what that something is. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm always like setting the tone for that. And I'm sure Amanda does that for you as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's not something where we were, I was taught in school. That's just mm -mm. something you like pick up along the way is setting the doctor up for success before they even come in the room. Mm -hmm. And when I'm running double hygiene, I tend to be kind of a stickler about let me get in there before the doctor. And everyone thinks I'm just a little like uh, rigid, you know, and I'm like, no, this is this the flow. This is the system. I got to talk to this patient and get them prepped before the doctor comes in. <laughs> like, it's got to be me before the doctor. And so even though my assistant sometimes would love to just have the doctor come in to just keep the time flowing. And I'm like, I don't care about time. Sorry. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it's what they taught us in hygiene school, right? Like we don't, we don't exist in time. No, <laughs> not, just, just doctors do. It's a process. You know, we <laughs> processes as hygienists. It takes however long it takes, but. <laughs> well, and I think what you're trying to get at as well with, you know, we want to get in there so we can make our doctors a superhero, but we know patients sometimes need to hear it three times before it becomes real. And oftentimes, you know, we're the ones, we're taking the x-rays, we're taking a look in there, um, or the assistant, one of the two, but we're the first ones in there and we can bring it to the attention. And, you know, we're always the ones that have nothing to gain. It's always the greedy doctors that have everything to gain. <laughs> So we're, we're that nice, unbiased, like, hey, I see something's going on here. We'll see what Dr. Wagner has to say when he comes in. I'm not sure. It could be a filling. We'll see what happens. But he's the one that diagnoses. Crown, but if he diagnoses a five-surface crown, we're going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> be like, I'm not the doctor. I don't know. So. <laughs> and that's kind of like I talked about before. If you don't know how to really utilize your assistants or your hygienist, then those are those assets that you're just not taking advantage of and you're not going to get that practice off the ground. Definitely. Do you want to ask the next, next question, Joffrey? I do. Okay. So Dr. Wagner, um, I have spent so much time like researching, uh, the hygiene field and knowing how many openings there are, what those job ads look like, what the wages look like, what the benefits look like. I had never actually dabbled into dentist job ads until we da -da -da, 
had a dentist on the <laughs> podcast. And so I did though, I, I Googled like dentist jobs in Utah and like over a hundred ads shown up. Like you guys are clearly in high demand right now. I, I couldn't tell you who's in more high demand, the dentists or the hygienists. We're both <laughs> in high demand at this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and with you being a new grad, I'm just curious what sold you on working with Platinum Dental because you could have literally worked anywhere. Yeah. And that's what we heard about around, I'd say, maybe D3 year is, hey, you're going to be able to find a job. Don't worry about it. Like, find one that works out for you. And so the way I first became connected with Platinum is they so they do a yearly recruitment dinner up at the university of utah um they also host other um dental students from roseman university which is also here in utah and they so i was going to be out of town when they hosted their dinner and so i was like oh you know i'll i'll see whatever and i missed the dinner i was going around shadowing several offices um, I even flew out to Oklahoma to check out a group out there that I was interested in. And mm. I mean, they were awesome. If I didn't want to move out to Oklahoma, that's uh -uh. what ultimately turned me away from them. Solid, but, um, solid decision. <laughs> but um, so I reached out to Platinum. I was like, hey, I know this is a couple weeks late. I missed your dinner, but I'm interested in learning more about your organization, kind of seeing how, what the culture is like, yada, yada, yada. And they're like, great, let's schedule a time that works for you. You can come down to our main office um, in Utah County and we can just meet with you. I was like, okay, great. And so we set up a time, went down early afternoon. Um, they say I could bring my wife. I was like, okay, that's, that's good. They care about not just me as a provider, but me and my family making sure that we think it's an okay fit. And we went down there and I was mostly expecting to meet with a recruiter, but then the owner of platinum comes in. He's like, Hey, Dr. Wagner, how's it going? And introduced <laughs> himself. And he was, I mean, he was a great guy, extremely patient, talked with us um, for several hours, actually took us around to like an office to show us around, answered every question was very transparent. And so I was like, okay, if the owner's willing to take this time just to kind of give me a sales pitch to a new student who's, let's be honest, not going to be the most profitable person for them to hire right out the gate, um, that kind of impressed me. And so I was learning more about it, doing some more research. And then as I was looking up some of the doctors online, I saw um, Dr. Vernon. And I was like, wait a second. I know who Dr. Vernon is. He was a doctor that I had done most of my shadowing hours to apply for dental school Oh, stop um, it! several years ago. And I was like, hold on. <laughs> he has a, he has a private office, but it says here he's working in South Jordan. And I was, um, I was like, okay, um, let me reach out to him. So I called him up. I was like, Hey, I'm in school now. We'd been keeping in contact about every year. Or so while I was in school, kind of just checking in, seeing how things were going. I was like, Hey, um, are you with Platinum Dental? And he's like, yeah, I am. I was like, do you mind if I come out, check out your office sometime and just chat with you? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So I went out, talked with Dr. Vernon and he only had great things to say about it. So he at the time had private ownership at an office as well as, um, he was working as an associate, um, soon to be owner, um, in that other office with Platinum. And he was just talking about how wonderful all the resources that Platinum provided, not just for all the advertising, but we, he talked about how there are different like study groups. We do lots of doctor summits. They'll have like spear groups where they'll use that education resource, just lots of collaboration, weekly doctor meetings, and just all these things that I was like, wow, that's, that's awesome. And that paired with Platinum's, um, I guess treatment philosophy or policy where the doctor is the one who basically has the authority to say what needs to be done. You're not under a um, constraint saying, Hey, we need you to produce X amount of crowns, X amount of root canals per month and so on. And so for me, I was like, okay, being able to come out of school, go somewhere that gives me a lot of good experience, 
gives me good mentorship and gives me access to the brains of hundreds of years of collective dentistry, I think was what kind of sold me. I was like, you know, it seems like a good, good organization from top to bottom. And everything that I asked was really transparent and they just told me straight up what it was. And they said, look, if like, we want to be really transparent with you because if it's not going to be a good fit, it's not going to help us and it's going to hurt you. And so the more, the more I learned about it, the more I was like, this is, I think what I need coming out of school to be able to continue to learn and to grow and to kind of stand on the shoulders of all the other providers that are part of the company. And it's been about exactly what I imagined it to be. So it's been, it's been awesome. <laughs> I, <love> that. <laughs> I know I had, we would never have known that if we didn't ask Amanda. Like, it's true. Is- no, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so we both know Dr. Vernon. We okay. Did. Okay. Yeah, How he's do you awesome. Know Dr. Vernon, Amanda. What? How do you know him? Uh, I worked at the South Jordan office. Um, I well, I attempt that I didn't work there, but I covered within Platinum. Okay, and yeah. then I helped Dr. Vernon for several months at his private practice right before he okay. sold to Platinum. He is a wonderful dentist. So. I love that we all know Dr. Bird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. <laughs> oh, the dental world. <laughs> he did tell me he would come on the podcast and we could talk to him about um, owning his own practice and being part of the DSO and why he chose to make his choices, right? So anyways, that's kind of cool that I'm going to have to reach out to him now. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Now we'll have two platinum doctors on here, so... The there whole you go. collection. I know. <laughs> I'm going to have to get some of my um, signature dental partner doctors on here coming up to even out our playing field, Amanda. <laughs> I, I think Dr. Clark would. I'm sure Dr. Diaz would. Um, I have no doubt that Dr. Christensen would if I reached out. So, because he's the coolest periodontist ever. That's pretty great. <laughs> I do have to say, um, one of my favorite things about being part of Signature Dental Partners is one of the co-founders is a hygienist. Oh, that's true. That's a fair point. That's cool. Lots uh, of hygiene support there. Yes. Yes. Um, I, that's definitely my favorite. Now, um, Amanda told me, uh, Dr. Wagner, that we needed to ask you a few random questions. <laughs> <laughs> and so yes. here goes nothing here. If you had to pick a mascot for the dental practice, would you pick A, a tooth fairy, or B, dental ninja? And then um, explain why. Explain why. That's the hard part. Or you can um, make up your own. We're not going to like tie you yeah, down to two I options. We could go see a very different option. Yeah, make your own. Okay. I'll think, I'll try to, I'll pick one and then try to come up with a good answer. Um, my first thought was a dental ninja. Is it because, because it's just more masculine? You know, I was a ninja for Halloween when I was like eight years old. And it snowed that Halloween. And it was freezing. And ninjas aren't the warmest people out there. <laughs> so it was one that's been ingrained in my memory forever. <laughs> but <laughs> my justification for it would have to be that ninjas are sneaky they get stuff done quick you know without people knowing and i think any dentist who can't well i should take apart the or pull out the without people knowing but (laughs) as a dentist if you can get some treatment done without people realizing each step along the way then i'd say that's pretty good but also you need a good hygienist so in this case (laughs) amanda can be our tooth fairy here Someone that everyone's excited to see because no one wants to go visit a ninja. But a ninja can get a lot done if everyone's happy <laughs> visiting with the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> um, Is that a good I, enough pop out for an answer? I like it. <laughs> I was leaning towards Dental Ninja too for a mascot. Um, my my husband and my son and myself, we all train jujitsu. And I'll often describe my son, who's six years old, like a ninja on the mats. So when I wrote that question, I'm like, oh, hands down, dental ninja. <laughs> Thinking of my- <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Okay. So another fun question here. 
so humor can be a great way to deal with patients' dental anxiety. What is your best dental dad joke that you like to pull out when necessary? <laughs> okay, so I did get a little heads up on this one, but I was ready for it. Um, <laughs> when because I was you're preparing, a dad. Exactly, I'm a dad. And um, while we were, while I was preparing for dental school interviews, um, I had heard from a few schools that they would ask you what your favorite joke was just to kind of catch you off guard, kind of see what your personality was, know what that. kind of humor you were into. Um, one quick side story with this. I interviewed with this um, student who was from back east and I was talking with him a little bit before all the interviews. We had kind of gone on a tour of the school and stuff. And then we came back after the interviews and he was just, his face was flushed and he was so nervous. I was like, hey man, like how, how'd your interviews go? And he's like, you know, it not so good. I, I don't know. I was like, Oh, what's like, what, what happened? He's like, well, they started asking me to tell a joke and I, it just kind of went downhill from there. I'm like, did you, could you think of one? And he's like, well, the first thing I thought of is I told him, Hey, are you from Tennessee? Cause you're the only 10 I see. And I'm just like, so you hit on the admissions officer and then had to sit with him for 15 minutes straight and he's like yeah it was so bad oh my gosh. wait is so, it dr clark on the admissions board he might be i'm not sure she, exactly who we entered she, with oh excuse me she, um so she very well easy. could be um i'm not i can't i can't oh say who gosh. he interviewed with but that <laughs> i i think of that story anyways my go-to joke one. that I would say is why are dentists the best athletic coaches? No idea. I don't know. Because they really know how to run the drills. Oh gosh. <laughs> that is <laughs> such a dad joke. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, so, yes I'm for dad like, joke. yeah, no, solid, <laughs> solid on the dad joke. I'm like still trying to get my head around like the 10 I see. Like, I understand the joke, but just like, yeah, how, yeah, you wouldn't. That go, was what came to mind. Recover. And he's like, I'm going for it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't recover from that. <laughs> nope. He was not part of our East class. Coast thing. <laughs> <laughs> So the lesson here is always have a joke on hand ready to go at any point in time. That's right. I don't have a dental one though. Are you kidding? No. No. Um, okay. I love to do jokes with the children who come into the office. And I love to ask them what kind of bear doesn't have any teeth. A gummy bear. Yes. And they love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like a good one. That's a good one for the kids. Okay, I don't have a dental one, but like my, I guess, go-to cheesy joke. Like, why did why didn't the melons get married in church, or why did the melons get married in church? I think I know, I know this one. I know <laughs> because they can't elope. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a dumb, cheesy one, but anyway, lesson learned. I guess I need to up my, my joke game. I've, I've never even thought about it. Like Always got to be ready. Game. You never know when someone's going to ask. Or now we have that, um, the only 10 I see card. I know, pretty much. <laughs> like, that's, that's all I'm going to come up with now. Thanks a lot, Dr. Wagner. <laughs> Okay, okay, we've got two standard sign-off questions that we usually ask hygienists. So we're going to just switch it up just a little bit here for you, Dr. Wagner. Um, what do you wish you would have learned in school that is something you have figured out so far? Yeah, um, kind of like we touched on a little bit, but just how to really work well with everyone in your office. Um, school teaches you the basics of dentistry and how to work on your craft but like i said you can't have an office unless you can really work well with others and get everything to run smoothly and i wish and i don't know how you would really implement this but learn how to 
work closely with the hygiene department, learn how to work with the front desk um, and learn how to really utilize your assistance to the best of your advantage. Um, because like I said, you learn a lot of those things in school and how to do them. And it's important to know that, but unless you learn how to trust and let other people optimize and maximize their skills, then it kind of feels like your, your wheels are spinning a little bit at times. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. All right. Um, what piece of advice do you wish you could go back and give yourself as a brand new grad? Brand new grad. Um, this is one I, it's hard cause it's an advice I did give myself, but it's one of those you just can't internalize in the moment, but just be patient with yourself. Not everything's going to be perfect. You're taught how to do everything perfectly and you know how to do everything perfectly but human component is always part of what we're doing whether it's on the operator side or on the patient side and just learn to work with the patients help them to understand that you're not perfect and don't get down on yourself if your maybe your crown margin was a little bit deficient in one area even though it still seals off great obviously don't make that excuse to do bad dentistry, but just be patient. There's lots to learn. You're going to be learning for the rest of your career and then some. And that's something I, I try to tell myself. And the times I need to hear it the most are the times that it's hardest to understand. So mm -hmm. I wish I could take my experiences now, go back to when I was freshly graduated and say, hey, this is all going to happen. Be patient. You do your best. You've learned a lot. You're going to be able to perform great dentistry. And even if it's not 100%, your best is, in most cases, going to be enough. Um, I love that. And I love that you said because we're practicing and it is like a dental practice. Medicine is practice. Like we're all practicing and we're like fine tuning our own art as we're moving, moving along. Mm -hmm. uh, so I love that. Be patient with yourself. It's very good. It's very, very good. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because um, we asked that question and so far we've pretty much had hygienists. And so it's it's interesting getting the doctor's perspective. But um, most hygienists have pretty much said, don't settle on the first practice, temp first. And um, yeah, so just very interesting to get the doctor's perspective on what yeah. that advice would be. Have patience, but have confidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There has been, I think, one or two isn't that, isn't it Joffrey? Like that they've said something of like along the line of having patience with yourself. I think so. Yeah. I, I can't remember off the top of my head now. Um, I know. But everyone has something good to share when we ask yeah. those questions. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner, for joining us this evening. We yes. definitely want to be respectful of your time with your family and your wife. Um, so we'll let you get back to life. Well, it was a pleasure. You the two-year-old jumping upstairs, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a good night, Dr. Wagner. Thank you. Thank you. See you Thursday. <laughs>